So thanks for the introduction and thanks for stopping by. Um, so yeah, this is a, a hearkening back to a to a simpler time when we used to see each other in person. And uh, we used to have these Friday data jams where we would kind of just go through some kind of method and just kind of work through a workflow on some example data and we'd all learn about a new technique. Um, and so I'm kind of hearkening back to that. Um, with uh, joint species distribution models. And so I'm kind of, for, for the data that we're gonna use, um, we're using the data from my master's thesis, um, which is now published. If you click on it, you can go to the paper. And um, so if you wanna follow along and code along with me, there is a repository with all the data from that study here. Um, so you can clone the repo by just going to the link and doing whatever whatever your GitHub method is. Um, I usually do the command line, um, but other people, there's like an app, I guess. I don't know. And so this presentation is edstalk.rmd, and it has all the code and everything. So, so we'll just get started. And um, and then there, there's a few packages that, pack, <clears throat> packages that need to be installed. Um, these This is the... JSDM package and then a required package that, that we need. And I'm going to start out with a little bit of background. Um, so for those who do want to follow along and need to scramble to get all this stuff downloaded and installed, there will be five minutes or so of me talking about the ecology for a minute so you can get caught up. So, so yeah, years ago in 2016, uh, we went out to Nevada and I was studying uh, Cheek, cheek grass and how it's uh, excluding sagebrush and um it's kind of interesting because if you drive around nevada you kind of you know there's the salt flats and then there's like the mountains with with the uh, pinion and juniper trees and then everything in between is sagebrush or it's just fields of annual grasses and there's kind of nothing in between um and it's just kind of this like kind of crazy mosaic of all this grass that kind of looks the same and then all these kind of unburned shrublands. And when I was driving around Nevada, like I also had these like fire history maps that I was using to guide my sampling. And so to me, it's like you look and see that this is all look the same, but it's actually this complex mosaic of fire history. And um, so I guess it kind of begs the question, like, even though this all looks exactly the same, like, are they exactly the same? Um, or is something actually like going on that we don't really see with plant community composition and diversity? And, and just kind of an aside, this little patch here is an unburned sagebrush spot that is just like, this is this blue spot right here. And uh, just like this little tiny hill, this little ridge line, and then the wind always comes from this direction in this part of the because it's you're we're kind of in a topographic little tunnel almost. And so like all the many times that this area has burned, it just bypasses this little spot. <laughs> um, so yeah, might be an interesting tiny little spot to do a study on. Um, but anyways, so um, back to the study here. So I did a I created this big uh, sampling design where we we stack together a bunch of fire data to create a fire history atlas um, uh, of fire frequency. And we kind of excluded a bunch of areas based on land ownership and everything. Um, and then we found, we looked for spots where we could find zero, one, two, and three fires um, as close together as possible. And then we just did uh, vegetation plots and sampled soil and some other things as well, but um, didn't end up using any of that other stuff and just mainly used the diversity sampling. Um, and this is across like this is about 100 miles by 100 miles here. So we kind of did a lot of driving. And uh, so what we found was that the diversity indices were pretty straightforward and easy to interpret. Like here's a species accumulation curve by fire frequency. And so this is kind of a way to account for imperfect detection and, um, and estimate the regional species pools. Um, and so here you see your unburned plots are going way up. And I think the estimated species pool for the unburned plots was in the hundreds. And then you get down to the thrice burned plots and you're already getting an asymptote. It's all, almost hitting the asymptote at seven fires. And so I think the estimated species pool there was like 12. 
And so um, kind of begs the question like, okay, I think something's going on where fire tolerant plants are the only things that can survive when you burn them three times in 10 years, or I guess it's about 25 years. Um, and so another thing we, we found pretty good relationships between um, diversity indices and cheatgrass cover. So you see this consistent decline of Shannon Weaver and Pilau's evenness, and then the richness and beta diversity weren't as straightforward, but, um, but then once you get to the, to looking at uh, community composition, it was like less straightforward. So we did some permanovas and we did some non-metric multidimensional scaling ordinations. And so here we have the unburned plots on the left and the burned plots on the right. And like, because I personally estimated the percent cover of every single plot on this map, I know exactly what this means, but I'm guessing other people like, don't just like, this doesn't just make complete sense to everybody who looks at it. Um, but you know, you can see that there's a difference between burned and unburned and there's something kind of weird going on where like three burned plots are kind of all over the place. And then the once and twice burned plots are in this nice little ellipse here. Um, and so I always kind of wondered like what, man, I wish I just had a way to like look at the individual species effects. Um, and so then years later I learned about this. Oh, sorry, backing up a little bit. And the, so another, another way to break out the uh, looking at, try to, try to understand how things affect um, the individual species is to kind of break it up by origin and life form and look at the cover. But then here, this plot doesn't really show you that this blue bar here is all sagebrush and these are all like rabbit brush and tetradymia which are like more fire tolerant shrubs and so you kind of or no not tetradymia like crisis than this specific forest and so you know like even this you you does tell a story but doesn't doesn't really tell the whole story and so that's where joint species distribution modeling comes in and so this is a method where instead of, it's basically just like doing a linear model, except for having one species as the response variable, you have your entire species matrix as the response variable. Um, and so as you might imagine, it's computationally intensive and like pretty complicated. So it's kind of a thing that has just kind of gained popularity now that everybody has super powerful computers and has access to cloud computing. And so this is a really great article about it um that i'll just kind of like go through the pictures on real quick um got the doi here and so this one of the really cool things you can get from jsdms is the residual correlation matrix and so like after you've accounted for all the environmental filters and everything you can see like uh which species are still associated with each other um and so here you have a bunch of species that you know, after you've done this whole model, they're still kind of more likely to be found with each other. And then here's kind of species that are antagonistic towards each other, I guess you might say, um, with a negative residual correlation. Um, and there's a lot of different types of JSDMs. There's a lot of different methods, and this is still like a really active area of development. So this paper came out, I think, in 2017, and there's already like a bunch of new improvements on all these things. So this is already kind of out of date, but, um, and I don't really know what any of this stuff means really, but I do know what Markov chain Monte Carlo means, which is nice because this is the method that we're gonna use. Um, and then here's just kind of like an illustration of how all these different approaches to creating joint species distribution models have kind of different pluses and minuses, different capabilities. And so depending on your use case, you might wanna use a different approach. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a lot of literature out there um, that you can dive into. And so, but what, what we're gonna use today is uh, HMSC or hierarchical modeling of species communities, which is a Bayesian Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo approach. And so here it takes as the input variables, your, your random effects. So this is uh, the S represents just basically your latitude and longitude coordinates. And then you can also add in random effects. So like, if you remember from the plot that I showed you with the map, each of those little squares is a study block. And so I incorporate that as a random effect. 
And, uh, and then you kind of have your community and environment matrices where each site is a, is a row in the data frame and each species or ecosystem function is a column. And then you can also incorporate phylogeny and trait matrices here. And then um, it's kind of nice because HMSC already has the DAG already figured out. So that's a lot of parameters that they have already determined that we need to estimate. And I'm glad that they did that. And so I don't have to do it. So, and so um, for more information, there are some really great papers um, by Tikhanov um, in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. Um, really great supplementary material. And I think they've also recently published a book. Um, and those resources are very important to have because the actual R documentation is kind of pretty bad. Um, like, so for example, if you just say question mark for any of the functions, it says question mark for compute associations. It computes the associations. It's like, thanks. It'd be nice if they told us why or how they did it or anything, what the data structure is. That would be nice, but so yeah, you really need to get the papers and maybe buy the book if you really want to get into it. Um, so now we're just going to run through the workflow here. Um, this is just a bunch of data wrangling because I collected some really messy data, and so don't pay too much attention to this. But the one thing, the one detail with the data wrangling is that it wants the site identification words to be as row names instead of as like a column named plot. So you have to have column to row names here. Um, so it wants rows with the site IDs and then every, all the columns have to be um, the species names. And then it's the same kind of deal with the environmental data. Um, so yeah, a lot of data wrangling, which I won't get into too much. And then and then finally, we take our diversity matrix. Um, and I have here turned all of the percent covers into zeros and ones, because this is going to be a binary model, an occurrence or a presence absence matrix. But you can also kind of cheat and do abundance by converting your percent cover into fractional cover. So everything's you know between zero and one. So you just divide by 100. And that, I think, is pretty legit to do um for percent cover so if you want to model abundance um but with other types of um distribution data like if you have like fish counts or something like that you want to do a poisson or a log normal distribution um so that that would be the way to do it here but with plant data a lot of times you just you're always doing percent cover so you kind of want to do a, like a logistic regression model and this doesn't have beta regression or hurdle models or anything so you can't do like you can't get super fancy you kind of just got to hack together the probit model um and here i'm also creating a prevalence data frame where this is just saying how many sites did each species occur at and so that will become more obvious later why that's important um and then here we're just creating the x data frame where there's just a couple of things i had to remove a bunch of columns here because this software does not like NAs. And so I had to either delete rows or delete columns. So I just deleted rows and then or columns. And then it does not like character vectors. So everything, any kind of factor it has to actually be a factor. Well, you can't just cheat and have it be a character. <clears throat> and then finally, we have our model. The final part of our model setup is putting the formula. So I'm predicting our species matrix by elevation aspect fire frequency, um, litter cover, which is pretty important because the in the native or the pre-colonial sagebrush ecosystems, there's not really a lot of litter. And then all the plants are kind of dependent upon, upon having bare minimal mineral soil to germinate. And so once cheatgrass invades and covers the entire landscape with uh, like a solid layer of litter, that really messes up plant's ability to germinate. And so that's an important variable. And then this is animal unit months per acre. Uh, so it's kind of a accounting for the grazing intensity. And then finally, we have our study design and random levels. So it's kind of a janky, weird setup, but this is how you do it. And then, um, and then 
you know, the, you, if you were doing traits, you'd also be putting them in there too. So finally, we, we set up our model. So this isn't actually running the model. This is just um, specifying the model, I guess you'd say. And so this is checking, this is checking all the data for making sure there's no NAs in here, um, making sure everything's set up right. So before you end up doing the big Markov chain Monte Carlo thing, you you set your model object, and then that kind of checks to make sure everything is set up right. So next, once we get our model all set up, then we have to set up our Markov chain Monte Carlo the Markov chain Monte Carlo sequence. Um, oh, thanks for the, let's see here. Just checking the, the oops. I was just checking the chat quick and now I've lost my screen. There it is, okay. Um, so a lot of times when you set this thing up, you, you do it, do like a short test run and then you start adding iterations until you get the model convergence. So you don't just start out with uh, 2 million iterations and then wait five days and then realize you made a mistake. So uh, here I have it as test run equals false because I already, I already ran the uh, bigger model and, um, and I just have it loading it instead of um, like running it again. But so this is an example of like how this works is the thin means every 10 iterations it takes a posterior takes a posterior sample and saves it and then it does it until it reaches 100 posterior samples and then transient is basically the burn in so here we're saying thin time samples times 0.5 so that's a thousand times 0.5 so it does 500 iterations before it starts saving samples. So theoretically, you kind of want to wait till the model starts to converge and then you take posterior samples. And so you know, for the test run, you just do this thing that takes one minute. And then for the, I did like a mini, a little bit of a longer test run that took 20 minutes. So I added a, added another order of magnitude of samples to be collected. Um, and then, um, Another key thing here is the number of chains. And so you do this whole thing and you do it, um, you know, two or more times uh, separately. So that way, in theory, the different, the separate change will convert, the separate chains will converge on the same solution. Um, so yeah, again, this stuff takes a long time. So I usually have it set up here where I, where I record the time before and after. I set up a file name before, so this would actually probably be better to put in the uh, that test run statement, so you can have different file names for different iterations, numbers of iterations. So I have my file name, and then uh, and then I have an if statement. If that file does not exist, then I'll run it, and if it does exist, I'll just load it. And um, yeah, and so then when I run it here, then I save the file out, and then. Yeah, minimizing the amount of processing time I have to do. And so, and then here you're, you have your model object that you already created, and this is just all the, all the Monte Carlo sampling parameters. And then this, this has a nice option to do each chain in parallel as well. And then I kind of forgot what this means, uh, but this is all those parameters that we set before. And uh, yeah, that's something that starts with the NF doing it adaptively i assume so <laughs> it's been a while since i actually did this and so once we run our model we create a couple of different objects we get our posterior predictions here we compute some predictive values which we then use to evaluate the model fit so the preds goes into the model fit um <clears throat> and then we can also create a variance partitioning object so we can see which of the different environmental filters that we added in there, uh, how much of the variance are they explaining? And so there's just different ways to visualize it and interpret the model. And so first we kind of want to look at our model diagnostics. And so this is just a bunch of data wrangling for ggplot. And then, um, so the, the two things that I've been using are effective sample size and the Gelman diagnostic. Um, with the Gelman diagnostic, you want it to be less than 1.001. So this is showing that this is not cutting it, like doing the 20 minutes. Probably want to 
add a couple orders of magnitude to get a really good convergence. And then again, here, this, this effective sample size, we have, we're drawing a thousand samples and two, we got two chains, so that's 2000 samples. So this should be converging on 2000 samples. And, but there's still a lot of weird stuff going on that, uh, that it hasn't quite solved yet in its iterations. And so, um, so yeah, this is looking bad, but, uh, you know, that's just because it's a test run. And so these things will eventually get better the more iterations you do. So here's just an example of a paper that I'm currently doing, um, about to submit actually, where we did four chains and a thousand posterior samples and our estimated sample size is right at 4,000, nicely centered around it. And then most of our Gelman diagnostic is below 1.001. So everything's looking great here. And we have our beautiful effects of burn severity on all these different plants. And, uh, but that's a different paper. So once we get our, now that we know that our model has some convergence issues, we can just ignore that and pretend everything's great and uh, get on to our model fit diagnostics. So this probit model uses a uh, one of the various types of R squares to assess its explanatory power. And so here I've just kind of made a table. So you have a, so there's every species is its own response variable. So you have an R squared for every species. And so this, these are some, a lot of the really common species. This is tumbled mustard, sagebrush, squirrel tail. People who botanize in the Western US will know all these species. Um, and then we start getting into the less common species down the line. Um, and we see we have pretty good R squares here for for these common species. And then, you know, then it starts to tail off as we go down. And so we kind of see that our our kind of see a histogram of our R squares. We have our most of them are kind of in the 20 to 30 range here. Um, one of the reasons for one of the things that has a lot of control over R squared is the prevalence. And so here I've plotted the prevalence or the number of plots that each plant is found at. And we see that it's kind of like a pretty clear pattern in the R squared values and prevalence until we get up to like three or four sites. And so it just kind of highlights the importance of getting a higher sample size. And yeah, if I could have just done 10 more plots, <laughs> uh some of these would be better so um but a giant fire burned half of my plots in that in that study so that's kind of what happened there um so yeah important to important to understand this so sometimes people will pool multiple species together so maybe uh maybe these uncommon plants will get grouped together by the genus or you just kind of you know call it good and accept that you don't have a good R squared. And so next we're going to talk about um, variance partitioning. Um, this is again just a bunch of data wrangling because the base plots don't look pretty enough for my taste. So I just did all this stuff to make everything look nice. And so here is kind of what it looks like. I have it sorted by our variable of interest, fire frequency. And again, we see some kind of biologically meaningful results because this these two plants here the cheatgrass and tumble mustard which are the kind of like the main two species that you see after fire in these systems and so fire frequency is explaining like half the variation in these two plants and then on the other side you see most of these species are native here and they're getting they're more just um, getting explained by elevation or in some of these have are getting really affected by litter here. So you see either, as you'll see in a minute, you see either positive effects of positive effects of elevation dominating the variance, or negative effects of litter on native species dominating variants. And so that's so this is a great plot, but it it tells you the how much variance is explained, but it doesn't tell you what direction the effect is. And so that's where this comes in. So again, more data wrangling. And um, so now we can see the effect of our environmental filters on each species. So I've uh, filtered out all the species that don't have any significant effects and all the environmental filters that don't have any significant effects. 
And we see here that elevation has positive effects on all these native species. And so um, just to, just in case you don't know your USDA plant codes by heart, um, most of these positive effects of elevation um, effects are on natives. And then we see the, the effects of fire frequencies one, two, and three. And most of these plants are very badly affected by um, getting burned three times since 1984. And then we also see that mo uh, most of these native plants are negatively affected by the amount of litter cover. And with the exception of, here's our CL2, tumble, must tumble mustard loves being burned. However many times you wanna burn it, it just lasts for more. It loves being covered by cheatgrass litter. And then here's Poa secunda, which is kind of known to be fire tolerant. So it's kind of unaffected or benefiting from a couple from some fires. And then this RC6 here is a rhodium secutarium, another very common weed. So that's benefiting from three fires. And then here we have cheatgrass, which is benefiting from fire. Um, so pretty cool that all these make all these results make pretty good sense. So even though we don't have really good model conversions with 20 minutes makes you feel confident that, um, um, you know, once I send this off to the AWS instance for a couple of days, then um, this will all probably look pretty similar um, based on the fact that it's kind of passing the, the smell test. And just, this is also just a, this is just to show you the base plot functions. And yeah, kind of not quite as, not quite as nice. And, um, so now we have our another way to look at this is to just look at the um, the grade the predictions along a gradient, and so we can kind of have our same cast of characters, but we looking we are looking at it here as on a on a gradient of litter cover. So we have our sagebrush here, which we know needs mineral soil to germinate and does not do well with increased litter cover, and then our Cicimbrium altissimum, tumble mustard, doing awesome with more litter cover. And then pretty much everything else really doesn't like being covered in cheatgrass litter. So um, yeah, everything's making pretty good sense here. And then we can also wrangle the data in a little bit of a different way and get, a, get the categorical and do this along a categorical gradient. And so here's a fire frequency on the x-axis. And then we have, um, our different species. So again, Cisimbrium loves getting burned, Erodium, super down to get burned. And then a lot of our native plants, not as into the getting burned. Um, sagebrush, super not into it. Um, but then, yeah, a lot of these non-natives are super down with getting burned. So um, yeah, and then finally we get our species co-occurrence matrix. And so this is pretty interesting here because, um, so this is again, the residual associations um, between species. And uh, what you notice here is that there's not a lot of strong residual correlations between species. And this is um, actually lines up with some of the theory behind alternative stable states and invasion ecology. So if you have a system dominated by invasives, you don't have these like relationships that have evolved together over millennia where these plants have developed, um, you know, facilitative interactions. They're just kind of like, they're taking over everything. And so it's kind of what you expect with an invasive dominated alternative stable state, you would expect weak interactions. Um, and then here, all these species that are kind of having relatively strong interactions are a bunch of natives with a couple, a couple of non-natives in here, Lepidium perfoliatum, for example. Um, so yeah, and that's about it. This is um, just so just to recap. There's a lot of different JSDMs. Um, we'll have a lot of time for questions or an opportunity to end early. Um, so yeah, JSDMs are a new method, requires a lot of computing time, 
but um, and there's a lot of different approaches and each one is pretty complicated and requires a lot of learning to kind of figure out how to use. Um, but, you know, you get really cool results and, and it's stuff that you really couldn't do before. Um, and so just to recap, um, we did a lot of data wrangling. We did a probit model on an occurrence matrix. Um, we got some iffy convergence diagnostics because it was just a test run. And then we saw how the R square is dependent on prevalence. And then we, we looked at some vari variance partitioning, looked at the effects of environmental filters, and um, looked at the residual correlations. And uh, so I just saw a question in the chat here. This is That's my whole talk, by the way. And so there's a question, are all GSDMs Bayesian? No, they're not. Um, I'll look back here. So just for example, from that paper, so you can actually just use a LMER <laughs> or a GLMER to do a JSDM. I have no idea how, but um, but a lot of these methods are Bayesian. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Anna. I think Anna Spears had a question. Oh, uh, no, I was just clapping for you. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. Oh, these those are those little claps. Okay, so Wayne Moss has a question. Could I go to the random effects in a little bit more detail? Is it just accounting for spatial autocorrelation or are the sites sampled multiple times? Um, so, so in this case, uh, the sites were not sampled multiple times. So the 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 random effect that I used in this case was just uh, the study blocks. So basically just assigning a different intercept to each study block. But you can add in um, spatial coordinates. So then you're accounting for spatial autocorrelation. Um, it just, it does, it kind of adds an order of magnitude to the amount of time that it takes to process. Um, uh, so that's kind of why I didn't do it here for this little example talk. Um, and then I think if you, if you, um, if you use each site as a random effect, then you would be accounting for repeated sampling. So the species interaction matrix, I'll show the screen. So the species interaction matrix is, um, it's kind of like spatial autocorrelation where you have, you have dependence. So like if you were, if you were gonna make a spatial model and you had different, um, if you had different, like, okay, I'll use the, the election polling, for example. So if you have one county or one state that has really good polling because it's a swing state, and then another state right next to it that has not a lot of data, um, but it has all similar demographic and, uh, you know, political leanings, those two count, those two states are going to be correlated with each other. And so you can use that spatial autocorrelation to, um, to predict that, okay, yeah, so this, even though there's not a lot of polling here, it's gonna be really similar to the county next to it. And so, um, so that would be an example of a residual correlation. Um, so those, cause those two models would, or those two states would both be in, they would both have positive residuals and they also would have um, be like close to each other in space. And so here you have two species that are both, um, given some whatever environmental variables their their residuals are going to be like correlated with each other no matter what and so that kind of just uh, assumes that they're um implies that there's some kind of um relationship either positive or negative between the two i don't know if that makes sense but Yep, this is this is the same thing, pretty much. Yeah, I actually <laughs> the reason I put the little bit about how the help file is not very helpful was that I was trying to look that up to make sure that this was actually a residual correlation matrix, and then it just says like computes associations. So, but I but so then I had to go back and read the paper to to make sure that this was actually the same thing, and so yeah, it is. 
Any other questions? I have a quick one. Yeah. Um, so it looked like environmental filter, the environment or climate came out as one of the most important filters. Climate? Was that right? Did I in, miss uh, um, in the example? Yeah, right at the end. Maybe I just misunderstood. That's what I wanted to clarify. When you had those one, yeah, here. Oh, oh this elevation. is just elevation. So which is a proxy for moisture. Right. So well, yeah, my question was essentially going to be about the range of variation, because isn't this in these different communities are almost in identical elevations and climates and things, are they not? Um, they're in each study block, the elevations are pretty similar, but between between study blocks, there's a, a decent range. Right. right. I think the elevation ranged from like 1200 to 1650, I think, meters. So, um, so definitely like getting the full range of um, elevational gradient of, for the sagebrush, um, that like that elevation band where the sagebrush occurs. So I definitely got, I got some stuff on the lower end, I got some stuff on the higher end, I got stuff in the middle, so. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. Um, yeah, and it just feels like phylogeny would, if elevation plays that <clears throat> big of a difference in the model, that phylogeny, the throwing of phylogeny would probably make it pretty, it feels like the model's pretty sensitive right now. Oh yeah, it's uh, just some of that trait phylogeny stuff might be helpful. Yeah, we need a couple million more iterations and then yeah, it'd be nice to have, it would have been nice to measure the traits in hindsight. Yeah. Um, but even just doing a, a PGLS, a phylogenetically corrected version might, um, might throw something in there but it's curious to me that elevation is that powerful oh yeah if you want to drive out to nevada i can show you <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely because like yeah. yeah yeah the low end of the elevation range things are just so dry mm -hmm. and um once you get once you get up to like 1500 it's just like it starts getting way different as far as just um the diversity is increases and um yeah the one thing i wasn't really i was kind of surprised about that was that aspect didn't really come out in here but right yeah. interesting adam you've got a lot of hands raised matt and anna have oh okay i'm sorry i don't see the hands raised let me see let me uh, grab the participants I'll, here. I can start. I'll just call on Matt, and then Anna oh, sure. will get to you next. Yeah, no, my question Sorry. is kind of a quick one. Um, yeah. it, it was simply, um, so after going through this particular treatment, were there any surprises revealed to you in terms of species that either appeared in the kind of fire frequency domain or species that uh, were resilient in the fire's pre they, that this kind of analysis uh, violated your expectation going into the native versus non-native species? So. Um, not really. It all seemed pretty obviously, or it just all seemed pretty, um, pretty, straight, pretty straightforward. The one thing that had that did surprise me was this ceratocephala right here, but I'm pretty sure that's just because of um, imperfect, imperfect detection because this is like a tiny little plant and um, it's like this big and so, I think I just didn't really, I didn't really do like a, when I did, when I collected this data, I didn't go through the whole plot and collect every single, and make sure I detected every single species in the 50 meter square. And so, um, so some of these little tiny plants kind of got um, missed out when there's the ton of litter. So that was really, that's kind of the only thing I saw that was surprising. Um, and, uh, oh. Matthew, do you have a follow-up question? Oh, okay. Uh, how about uh, Anna? Uh, yeah, going back to the correlation matrix, you may have already said this, but can you, um, like, did you have a hypothesis of, uh, uh, can, I guess, can you say how um, the columns and rows are ordered? Um, oh. 
And like, was there a certain way you expected them to be ordered or do you do that manually yourself? This particular correlation plot, I just said hierarchical clustering order equals true. And so it just kind of tries to group things together. So that's why all the blues are close together and the reds, but there's not a ton of rhyme or reason. It would have, if I was doing this for real, I might probably do it manually and make sure that the natives and non-natives are separated so you can see that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and I guess going back to Matt's question, I was actually pretty surprised initially that cheat grass down here um, what didn't have any strong effects because like you would think that, that would have a huge effect on everything since that's kind of what's going on. Um, so, and I don't know if that's that another thing that I've neglected to mention that is that because this is an occurrence matrix, cheatgrass occurs at every single plot. And so that might be behind why there's nothing happening here is just because it's everywhere. So you can't really, it's just like, it's, there's no gradient of cheatgrass occurrence. It's just always there. So that was kind of the one thing that I saw. So that's one of the reasons why I would, if I was going to do this for real, I might do the, also do the abundance um, model as well, just to see how that ends up looking. And then, um, yeah, does that answer your question, Anna? Yeah, yeah. I was just curious about that ordering. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Matt, you got your hand raised there. Oh, okay. Well, cool. Well, thanks for letting me give a talk. If, if there are no further questions, um, yeah. Thank you so Definitely. much, Adam. I actually have a quick question for you, Adam. Oh, sure. Um, about spatial resolutions. So. Species. With your species distribution modeling, you have like all of your species, which you collect from field plots, which are usually much smaller than the resolutions that we would get, let's say topography, unless you had, let's say LIDAR or something, which is very high res and honestly actually quite noisy. So you might have like S3TM, but like if you're looking at, at putting data into your species, your joint species distribution model, how does the spatial resolutions play a role in determining um, correlations? So, you know, and again, thinking about like Ty's comment about topography and, you know, that to me actually is less surprising because, you know, that topography is kind of the basis of the climatic niche species original species distribution models from the early 2000s mm -hmm. but like when we think about okay well that's climatic now we've got like met variables that are influencing why you might see certain species in certain topographic conditions but those resolutions are like four kilometers and your plots are obviously much finer I guess I was just wondering if you could speak about spatial resolutions as inputs into these models and like what you considered or how that might play a role? Uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing that I um, used remote sensing for in this analysis was the fire data. And so that was at a 30 meter resolution and everything else is just measured on site, um, except for the, obviously the, the grazing intensity is kind of a weird, like government record thing that there's just like no good data that's like the only good data you can really get it's not even good data but um yeah i don't know like i think um if you were going to try to predict this out and like actually try to make a raster surface of of um the, you know, the, of each of these species, it would be, you would have to come up with a remote sensing model of litter cover in this example. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think for this example, you would basically want Landsat resolution for anything you would use to predict out, because that's kind of the scale at which um, most of these processes are occurring. Um, I don't think, I think if you added in climate, that would be reasonable. Um, yeah, but 
I guess for me, like I'm not really using this to to make like to actually like predict species ranges. I'm just trying to look at the effect of of uh, environmental filters on species pools. And so I don't know, but I I think that's a great point that you make. How you that you can actually um, stack up a bunch of um, remote sensing data and actually use this to predict uh, species ranges, which is pretty interesting because you could use a lot of, I feel like a lot of species distribution models are predicting the range of one species. And so this would account for the interactions with other species. Yeah. Um, so you could you could kind of like predict out a whole regional species pool based on. Um, yeah, I, I was kind of thinking about like applications for biodiversity, you know, and ecosystem management where they're kind of looking for more like, where do we prioritize areas? So like, this is like, not to say that this isn't what you're doing is not valuable because it's hugely valuable to understand the underlying mechanisms. I'm just trying to like extrapolate out from these methods to some other applications that people might have within this group. Another one for me, actually, I think, which is kind of interesting or that has me thinking or that this has me thinking about is I actually used species distribution modeling for looking at fire niche mm -hmm. um, in some of my earlier PhD work. And we've like many of the people in this group have also been thinking about like compound disturbances. And mm -hmm. so like, like even thinking about like, oh, do, are there certain like disturbance niches or like conditions that set up for certain disturbances and how those might like set up for the, the space of thinking about um, compound disturbance niche space, if you will. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm that's... just trying to think about different applications that this might yeah. be useful and the different kinds of data people might want to integrate. Yeah, I mean, here you kind of have, you actually kind of have three disturbances here because you have fire, you have the effect of cheatgrass invasion, which you might think of as like a type of disturbance, <laughs> and then you have grazing intensity. Um, so, you you know, this, so this kind of, a, it's kind of nice because it accounts for all, all the different filtering effects um, while also accounting for space and um, design, study design, so. Yeah, awesome. Sorry, Elizabeth, I didn't mean to cut you off. So thanks, Adam, for just kind yeah. of going down that theoretical space for me. And, and then in the, um, in the, so this is just like my own little use case for the, the little study that I like to do, but like um, in the, in the, you know, the Tikhanov article, um, they, you know, they go into other types of applications. So if you, if you look at the paper, um, they get into more like predicting out species ranges and things like that. So. Awesome. How dare you, Natasha, for asking a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So that seems like that's it for today. Uh, next week, we're going to be hosting Jessica McCarty uh, from Miami University. Uh, and she'll be talking about rethinking the role of big data for Arctic fire mapping, monitoring, and policymaking. Um, and hopefully, I just checked the forecast. <laughs> it should be good to be at least partially in person. Obviously, everybody is um, free to attend remote as well. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Adam, so much.